Welcome to Manifest, hosted by international evangelist, teacher, and author Perry Stone. Enjoy unique insight into prophetic and practical truth. It's time to feast on fresh manna, so get ready to be blessed and encouraged. And now, here is your host and teacher, Perry Stone. Did you know a lot of times your own mouth releases warfare that you're battling? I happen to be standing in a very significant place historically as far as the Bible is concerned. I'm standing at the bottom of what is called the Tell of Jericho. The word Tell is a word that is used to describe a mountain or a mound upon which an ancient city once stood. Directly behind me is the ancient city of Jericho. Uh, way down into the lower levels of what they call the lower level of occupation where archaeologists have dug through are some of the remains of the ancient uh, bricks and cities of Joshua's time. There are many, many cities that have been built here over the centuries. But something happened here that I need to tell you about, and then we're going to build a study on how your mouth releases your own warfare. When the children of Israel were brought out of Egyptian bondage, when they crossed the Red Sea, God promised them He was going to give them the promised land. He was going to send bees to actually run the tribes out. He was going to do supernatural feats to defeat all of the tribes and even the giants that were in the land to give Israel their inheritance that was promised to their father Abraham. Now the problem was they complained 10 times in the wilderness. God finally said to them, I am so grieved with the words of your mouth. You've murmured in your tents and I've heard you. So God says, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to allow you for every day that you did not believe you could take the promised land. You remember the story, the 12 spies that went in and 10 of them came back with an evil report with their mouth. God said, because you came back for 40 days, you saw it was good, but you came back with a bad report. You're going to wonder for 40 years. And they did. Finally, at the end of 40 years, Joshua brings the children of Israel to the edge of Jericho, right across from the Jordan River here. And the captain of the Lord's host gives Joshua a plan. And the plan was real unique. Now pay careful attention to what I'm about to say. God says to them, for six days, you're going to march around the city and say absolutely nothing. You keep your mouth shut. Then he says, on the seventh day, you march seven times, you blow the trumpets and the walls of the city are going to fall. Now the significance of that statement is what I believe I'm about to tell you. I honestly believe that Joshua and God understood that If he had these people walk around the city for six days, people would say something like this. Can you believe we're doing this? This is the craziest thing in all the world. Why don't we just go up and fight? Why would God have us to do this, to walk around this city? Look at the people making fun of us. I really believe they would have talked themselves into a defeat. So Joshua, this is my opinion now, had an attitude like this. Look, I'm 80 years of age. I don't have another 40 years. So you all shut up. I'm not going to have you acting like your mother and father saying crazy things with your mouth and me having to go back in the wilderness another 40 years because I don't have another 40 years. So he had them remain silent for six days and only on the seventh day at God's instruction did they shout. So that's significant to understand that God at times would demand you to control what you say or to conceal certain things and not let it be known. Let me give you another example. This is one of the prime examples of the Bible that a lot of people overlook. This is found in 2 Kings chapter 19 and chapter 20. King Hezekiah was the king of Judah. And the Bible tells us that he had this great revival. As a part of the revival which he led, he took the brass serpent that Moses had built and he had it destroyed. That brass serpent had been in existence for 900 years and was located somewhere in the temple in Jerusalem. And people were actually burning incense to this brass serpent that only healed people one time. After King Hezekiah destroyed the brass serpent, he himself became sick unto death. Now, I know how people are. I I just know how people are. And I believe that probably they went around saying something like this. I'm telling you what, if Hezekiah hadn't destroyed that brass serpent, he could have walked in there and looked at that serpent the way the children of Israel did, and he could have received his miracle. Yeah, I bet you God is judging him, bringing a sickness upon him because he destroyed the brass snake. There could have been all kinds of reasons that people gave for Hezekiah being sick. But Hezekiah turned his face to the wall, And the prophet Isaiah, who had prophesied he was going to die, came to him and said, God has heard your prayer and God is going to give to you 15 more years. Now, in the process of this unusual story, here's the follow-up. 
King Hezekiah gets healed. But way in the distance from the land of Babylon, a group of men came in and they came with a letter from the king of Babylon bearing gifts to Hezekiah. And they were so glad that he was better and they were rejoicing with him. But Hezekiah did something very, very unwise. He took the Babylonians and showed them, showed them all of the secrets of the house of God all of the treasuries, all of the gold, all of the silver, all the vessels, the gold that was on the doors. And so the Babylonians were really impressed with all of this gold wealth. So when the Babylonian men headed back to Babylon, the prophet of God, Isaiah, walked in and said, Hezekiah, you have done a crazy thing. You revealed God's secrets. God had had this place secured just for the king and the priest and those to understand the wealth of Israel. But now you've showed the enemies of God all of the wealth. Here's what's going to happen. The Babylonians are going to come in and invade this place. The descendants that come out of your loins are going to be taken captive. And everything you see here will be taken to Babylon. Now, if I was Hezekiah and I had this word that suddenly my whole future uh, lineage was going into captivity and everything I had worked for was going to be taken into bondage, I do believe I could have humbled myself at that moment before the same God that healed me and said to him, God have mercy on me, what have I done? King Hezekiah says this really bizarre statement. Well, as long as there's good in my days, good is the word of the Lord. Basically, he was saying, I really don't care what happens to me after I'm dead and after I'm gone, although it's going to happen to a future generation. As long as I have peace in my days, I'll be happy. I'm going to just stop right here and jump off of my main thought on what I call a rabbit trail. You that hear me preach in meetings all the time, hear me talk about a rabbit trail. My biggest rabbit trail of the negative uh, concept that I hear from Christians is this. They don't, they're not concerned about the now as long as they're happy and they're blessed. You have a national debt that can't be repaid, but as long as they've got a job, they're fine. They're not worried about their kids and grandkids. This was Hezekiah's problem. I call it the Hezekiah syndrome. Everybody's concerned as long as they can make it now, and they're not thinking way into the distance about where all of it goes. And so this was the problem with King Hezekiah. So for the next few moments, I want to give you a couple of phrase that I have, phrases I have heard. Number one, talking too much can create your own warfare. Number two, the second thing is, you ready for this? Two people can keep a secret if one of them's dead. That's going to take you a moment to get that one. Let me say that again. Two people can keep a secret if one of them's dead. My guy Gideon showed me this one time. He said, what is this? And I said, it's one finger. And he said, what is this? And I said, that's one finger. He said, what is it? He, I said, well, I guess it's two fingers. He said, no, it's 11, a one and a one. And I said, so what's the point? He said, we're taught in the military that if you tell a secret to one person, likely that one person will tell it to other people and 11 people will end up finding about your secret. Joe Edwards, who's a friend of mine, who uh, pastor, a former pastor of Church at Liberty Square, came to teach a, um, I guess it was a staff retreat, what we, what we would call it, at, uh, for my uh, Voice of Evangelism staff several years ago, and he made a statement. And I want you to hear this statement. It's a military statement. It says this, loose lips sink ships. See, if I were to say something to you, and we were talking about a situation and you repeat it, the more it gets repeated, the more it gets distorted. The more it gets repeated, the more information gets twisted. The more it gets repeated, the more opinions are formed from it. And then the person no longer talks about the facts, but the further it goes down the line, the opinions become the facts. And then you hear a story and you're saying, where in the world did that come from? That wasn't anything like what happened. And so for the next few moments, I'm going to talk about keeping God's secrets, keeping God's secrets. There are things that the Lord can show you. Sometimes it's about the present and sometimes it's about the future that a lot of times it's best for you to hold back what he has showed you because others could mock it or others could discourage you from it. When I was 18 years of age, God gave me something called the Seven Point Outreach Plan for the Voice of Evangelism Ministry. First of all, He gave me the title Voice of Evangelism when I wasn't the voice of anything. <laughs> I was only preaching in a few rural churches in West Virginia, Virginia, and Maryland. And in the Seven Point Outreach that God gave me, the seven points included crusades, and uh, that, would, that would be evangelistic meetings. That's an older term that we used years ago. 
uh, there was a magazine, there was radio, there was, there was all sorts of media outreach, there was camp meetings, and I wasn't doing any of those. So what I did on the back of my book, the first book I ever printed, when I was 18 years of age, it said Seven Point Outreach, and the seven outreaches are listed on the back of the book, and I was doing probably one of them and wasn't even doing that very well. When I printed the book and distributed it, people began to mock me, and they said, who does he think he is, Or Roberts or something? Now, the problem was not what God showed me because everything there and much more has come to pass. The problem was telling it to people before they were ready to receive what the Lord had showed me. And there are times that you have to keep God's secret. Let me, let me, let me, let me share with you a couple things. First of all, God hid the mystery of the incarnation of the Messiah. He hid it for 4,000 years. The only prophecy you get is the seed of a woman is going to crush the head of the serpent. But a woman doesn't have a seed. A woman has an egg in her body, and the seed has to come from the loins of a man through the sperm or the seed of a man. And yet God concealed the mystery of how a virgin would conceive and bear a son, and they would call his name Emmanuel. How it was going to happen was through the power of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was going to come upon Mary, and she was going to conceive the Word of God inside of her. So God kept it hid for 4,000 years, I believe, to prevent the enemy from disrupting or interrupting the prophecy. I can show you other places in the Word of God. God hid, for example, the mystery of the church from the time of Moses all the way to the time that Christ began to talk about that the church is coming. Now, I'm going to share something with you. Deuteronomy 32 and 21 says this, that there would be a people who are not and a nation that is not that will provoke Israel to jealousy. Why would God hide the creation of the church, predominantly a Gentile church, that would join with the Jews and become what Paul said, one new man? Why would God hide that? Here's the reason I believe God would hide it. The question is this, and I wrote this down. Why did God hide in the grafting of the Gentiles to form one new man? Answer, Satan would have attempted to block the church's formation by taking out the leaders. Now notice this. The top deacon was Stephen in the early church, and he was stoned to death in Acts chapter 8. The top apostle was Peter, and Luke, uh, in Acts chapter 12, Satan went after him to have him beheaded, and yet he escaped by an angel of the Lord. The top Jerusalem leader was James, Acts chapter 12, and he was beheaded. The top Gentile leader was Paul, who was converted as Saul of Tarsus, the apostle Paul. Read the book of Acts. He was beaten to death in one city, stoned in Lystra and left for dead, snake bitten by a viper on an island. I mean, on and on, the enemy tried to kill the man. The top apostle after 70 AD in the church was the apostle John. And John, as you know, they tried to boil him in oil and God supernaturally spared him. He ended up on the Isle of Patmos where he received the revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ. I believe that if the church had been known and the revelation of the church's coming had been known, the enemy would have done everything in his power to kill the leaders of the church before the church was born or right at the time that they, it came into existence. So what did God do? He hid the mystery of the church. Now, number, number three, let me tell you something. One thing that God does is a lot of times people that he's going to use in the future, he hides them and pulls them back and conceals them for a period of time without bringing them into the public before the time. If God brought some people who are gifted and anointed and talented to a national scene before their time, they could become a novice and lift it up in pride. Paul even talked about that. But I'm going to show you a couple things. Christ was sent to Egypt until Herod died. John was hid in a desert until the time of his showing. That's John the Baptist, Luke 180. Paul went to Arabia into a desert for three years to receive the revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ, Galatians 1, 18 through 19. And John is put in a cave on the isolated Isle of Patmos where he received the revelation of the book of Revelation. Now, here's what you need to understand. In all of these cases, Christ, John, Paul, and the apostle John, and John being John the Baptist, the second John, all of these individuals had a prophetic word that had been spoken over them. Here we go. Christ is called the Son of God, and he had to flee into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil, and God had to protect him after the revelation that he was the Son of God. He is also called a, the Son of God by the angel Gabriel, and right after his birth, the angel comes and says, Now take the young child and his mother, Joseph, and flee to Egypt. John, in Luke chapter 117, it said the spirit of Elijah would come upon him, and the spirit of Elijah was to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children. 
So we see that John had a prophecy over him. Paul in Acts 9, 15 is called a chosen vessel that will bear the name of the Lord to the Gentiles. And, and the apostle John in Matthew 16, 28, Jesus said, some of you will not die until you see the Son of Man coming in the kingdom. So here's the point that I want to make. In all the people that I just listed, which are John the Baptist, of course, Christ, and you have the, the Apostle Paul, and you have the Apostle John. Number one, all of them had some kind of a prophetic word that was given to them. Number two, all of them had to be hidden at a certain time away from the public before their public ministry began. Paul, like I said, went three years to an Arabian desert just to learn about Jesus personally from Jesus himself. And the other thing I want to share with you is in every one of these instances, there were times when these individuals spoke and there were other times that they did not speak or they backed away from speaking. And I'm going to show you the spiritual principle behind that right now. Jesus said in John 14 and 30, Hereafter I will not talk much with you, for the prince of this world is coming, and he hath nothing in me. So Jesus at one, one point, I mean, he's preaching all over the place. He's meeting with his disciples. He's revealing the future. He's talking about redemption. He gets to one point, which is just before he goes in the garden of Gethsemane. And he says to his disciples, I'm going to shut my mouth from here on out. And I'm not saying much because the prince of this world, that's Satan. He's coming, but he hath nothing in me. Meaning you're about to see something happen, but it's not Satan doing it. This is all a plan of God. But Jesus knew when to speak and he knew when not to speak. Now, the reason I'm sharing this with you is simply because there are times that people create warfare by the words that they say. A husband and wife gets into an argument and they say things to each other that they long regret. Children get in arguments with their parents and parents with their children and they say things to each other that they regret. We can go on and on, and I'm sure some, some of you know situations right now that you've encountered in your life where your own words have brought spiritual warfare. I know there's been a few times in my life where I would say something and I think later, now that should have been said in a different way. Or I would say something and perhaps be misunderstood and didn't, didn't really say it in a certain way, but it was perceived a certain way. This might be the reason why in the book of James it says, let your yea be yea and your nay be nay, lest you enter into condemnation. Sometimes instead of someone ask you a question, instead of elaborating on it, did you like that? Yeah. Why? Oh, I just liked it. But no, we got to elaborate and go into details. And sometimes in our life, and this is, this is the word I'm giving you, and I'm giving it to you here from Jericho, because I want to go back to something I said at the beginning of the telecast. When Joshua marched these, the children of Israel around these city walls here in Jericho, he told them, the angel of God gave him the instructions, tell them to shut up for six days. Because if you say the wrong things at the wrong time, it can cause a defeat. And it, sometimes, I have to be honest with you, it counters the faith of what you're praying. I remember years ago, Robbie is behind one of our cameras that I was believing God for a situation and uh, went, was preaching and got through preaching and found out just everything went wrong. Everything was going bad. The situation fell apart. And I found myself complaining negatively about that situation. And that's when I had the Lord speak to me and said, son, don't abort your breakthrough. Now, I knew what the Lord was saying to me. He was saying to me, now, you've been praying, you've been believing, you have been talking that I'm going to do it. You've been telling people, I believe God's going to do this. Now you've seen a situation where it doesn't look like it's going to happen. You have to hold fast. This is in the Bible. Your confession of faith, and the King James says profession, the Greek word there means confession of faith, nothing wavering. Now, nothing wavering means to, if you say you believe today, I'm going to believe tomorrow, I'm going to believe the next day, I'm going to believe the next day, I'm going to keep believing. Now, when God told me not to abort my breakthrough, I stopped. Robbie was with me in the room, and I began to repent before God. And I said, I have said the wrong thing. God, cancel the words I've said. Cancel all that crazy stuff I was saying, because if I don't, here's what could happen. If I pray that I believe, and later I start talking like I don't believe, it can void everything I'm praying as the answer may, may take a year, two years. Daniel prayed 21 days. I mean, it can take a long time for the answer to come. Not that it takes a long time for God to hear, but it takes a while for God to deal with people's hearts. But after holding on for the length of time we did praying and believing, the Lord spoke to me one day and here's what he said. He said, now you've been asking and asking and asking and asking me to do this for a long time. 
I have heard you. I've heard you pray. It's now time for you to start thanking me. And I switched everything I was doing. So instead of praying, oh God, you got to help. God, you got to do this. God, you got to help us. God, it's up to you. Lord, you need to, you need to. Instead of doing that, I start saying, Lord, I just want to thank you. And I start, I start thanking God as though it had happened before it happened. And that's called Thanksgiving. And the strangest thing happened. Within 48 hours, everything I'd prayed for for eight years happened like that in 48 hours. And it was the most remarkable thing. In fact, when God answered, I don't know if you've ever been like this, but you pray so long that when God answers, it's almost surreal. It's like, hey, God really did this, didn't he? And you knew he would, but it's such a shock to you. And the transformation is such a shock to you. That's like, wow, this, this really, is, this is crazy. Praise God. Hallelujah. You know? And so I want to encourage you today, using the example of Jericho, there are times to speak and there are times not to speak. When you get in an area, and I have been the worst at this, I'm preaching to myself, where you, I'm quick to act, I'm quick to speak, I'm quick to respond, but the Lord's been trying to teach me how to just settle down. Don't, you don't have to respond immediately. Settle down, think about it, meditate on it, be quiet about it, and then come back and make the statement. Because a soft answer, this is Proverbs, a soft answer turns away wrath. It's very hard to fuss with someone who, who is not going to fuss with you. It's very hard to argue with somebody who refuses to argue. Finally, you just got to sit there and say, okay, whatever, you know. But I, I want you to, you, to be, be encouraged today that when God gives you something, let's say he gives you a prophetic word, something about your future, you don't always want to tell it if it's certain things related to ministry. Hide it in your heart like Mary did the words of the angel. And then as it comes to pass, write it all down, write the vision down, but as it comes to pass, then begin to talk about it more as you see it come to pass. That's just some wisdom from a fellow that's kind of been there a few times. My time's up on Manifest. Watch what's coming up. It's a special offer. I'll be back in a moment. I am very excited about an offer that we're making available, but let me explain it. With the events that have happened recently, you got the eclipse, you've got cosmic signs, you have hurricanes, you have North Korea threatening with war. We are in a major prophetic season, and I want you to have greater understanding on these seasons so that not only will you be informed, but your family will be. So here's what I did. I went to my library of messages on prophecy, and I personally selected six messages out of over 60 messages that I could have selected. Personally, I think these are the best right now word you can receive. And so here's the album. It's called Unlocking God's Prophetic Agenda. We have the message, has the tribulation already begun? Some people say it has, but has it? How to release and pray for angels during prophetic seasons. We can pray and release angelic help and protection during prophetic seasons. How do we do that? The third CD is the Lot Principle for Escaping End Time Judgments. Four out of the five cities were destroyed in the Old Testament, but Lot escaped. How did he do it? What was the key? Here's one I really love, the Passover Shinny, God's prophetic purpose. A lot of people do not know that there was a second Passover offered 30 days later for the people that missed the first one. So what does the Passover shinny mean prophetically? This is a great message you're gonna really enjoy. Here's the fifth one. When God changed the dispensations of time, time is on dispensations, how does God change it? And finally, seven prince spirits released by the dragon. Now when you order the album of six CDs, I'm gonna include this message called The Weather Factor. What on earth is going on with the weather in the United States? This will help explain it. So you can get the new album with the six messages plus the Weather Factor audio CD for a $35 love gift or more to the ministry to help us stay on the air. You can contact us at uh, 1-888-21-BREAD. That's a toll-free number. And uh, request, of course, offer GA-125, God's Prophetic Agenda Package. Or you can go to perrystone.org and order online. Or write me at Perry Stone, P.O. Box 3595, Cleveland, Tennessee, 37320. And enclose your love gift of $35 or more. But you must request the album when doing so. Now, this is important. You help keep Manifest on the air with these resource offers. So please contact us now so that we can get this into your hand, the new prophetic package made available for a limited time. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you for joining me today on the Manifest Telecast, and I really hope that you'll get the brand new offer, the prophetic messages, plus that additional CD on the weather factor. 
Uh, I want to address ministers in just a moment. Before I do, let me share with you some of the places we're going to be coming to. Now, forgive my voice. It's that season of the year where you have two or three days where your voice really is affected. So bear with me, please. On the 13th of October, I, I believe that's a Friday. And that's not a negative day, by the way, in Judaism. 13 is a good number, not a bad number. But Friday the 13th, Redemption Christian Tabernacle in Trip City, Ohio, Pastor Todd Hoskins, one service. I'm coming to Zion Family Ministries, and that's going to be in Wise, Virginia, October the 19th. All this information is on the website. And finally, we'll, we will end our itinerary for the year. Church of His Presence, John Kilpatrick, on Saturday, October 28th, Sunday morning, the 29th. Now, I have been hearing reports from pastors who've shared with me that ministers are quitting the ministry, that their wives no longer want to be in the ministry, they can't deal with the pressure. Sometimes they're having difficulty raising funds and they don't want to raise funds, so they're just stepping down. And Dr. Cutshaw, who is the chancellor of ISO, our upcoming uh, Bible school, Internet Bible School, and I, got together. You know, Dr. Cutshaw pastored a church in St. Louis, uh, thousands of members and uh, uh, is involved with church training. And so he's trained over 20,000 ministers in his ministry. And we were talking, we said, you know something, can we not do something to invite ministers, uh, just invite them to come and be a part of something where we can minister to their needs? Now, at probably every meeting I've ever been involved with when it comes to pastors, it was always church growth, how to grow a church, how to change the platform, uh, you know, how to make your church larger, and, and you have a lot of church growth conferences. Not too many minister to the needs of the minister, like what does he do when he's tempted? What does his wife do when she wants to quit? What do you do when your best friend betray you, be, uh, friends betray you? And this happens all the time in ministry. And I was thinking too, God has blessed us to run a debt-free ministry, and ministers all the time ask me, What's the key? Well, it was the way we prayed. We didn't just pray, we prayed a certain way. There were three keys to our ministry being debt free, and I'm talking about all of it. And so uh, I want the ministers, I want to put a bug in your ear that in the, in the month of February, I'm going to be having a MANA conference for ministers. And we want ministers and their wives to be able to come here, as many as possible, to join me and Dr. Cutshaw as we minister. Uh, Dino Rizzo's coming, Tony Scott's coming, so we've got other speakers. But I, I want to put that bug in your ear because I want you to plan it because I'm telling you, uh, you should pray for your pastor. You should pray for evangelists, all, all the ministries. That should be a daily part of your prayer because, as you know, the closer we get to the time of the end, there's going to be attacks of the enemy of different kinds, different types, that's going to come against our preachers and our ministers. So I want to encourage you, uh, give your pastor or your evangelist or the, the person that ministers to you, send them just a note or hand them a note of thank you. Thank you for the time you spent in prayer. People think doing a message is just you sit down and write something out. It is not. I have messages today. I am working on a message that I've been working on for four hours. Some of my messages takes 10 hours just for one message. Some of these messages from Israel, uh, it took a day or two for me to get the scriptures, get the word study. So it's work. But I want to thank you for your prayers and support and partner with us if you feel led of the Lord. We have a partner's ministry. You can go online and you know, get more information about that. See you next week. Perry Stone invites you to join him for his 2017 Israel tour. The dates are November 20th through the 29th with an optional visit to Petra in the country of Jordan. Call 1-888-321-3629 or visit perrystone.org for more information and how to register. Seating is limited, so call today.